Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome back to the VK Talks, this session of 3rd of December. Um, we are uh, celebrating a uh, VK Talk that was supposed to take place a couple of weeks ago. As you all know, uh, in these times of a pandemic, we need to be very flexible. Because of the rules back then, we needed to cancel or postpone it. And I'm, I'm personally very happy to be back uh, with this uh, Big Tech panel, which I hope everybody will enjoy. I personally uh, feel very touched by the topic that we are going to talk about today. So um, I'm very happy also that we have been able to organize these things to Studium Generale. Janik Surveys is all, uh, with us here today. And uh, let's get this started. Um, I'm going to start, start, I want to start with this, this image. This is the image of the first BK talk that we celebrated in the month of September. And it's very funny, I want you all to look at the K uh, in this slide. And I would like you to talk about the K that is not there today. Um, it's funny because today we're going to talk about contested heritages and contested elements of the past, etc. And I think it's funny that some of you have decided already to contest what we are doing. Uh, I hope that the K is now, uh, now in a very nice place. And if you wish to return it, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, but let's get to the bottom of the matter, why we are here today. Um, this is a topic, contested heritage, that in a way touches me quite a lot. Um, I want to start with this picture. This picture is uh, a series, a collection of pictures. I take pictures of the same place again and again and again. And this is the view from the window of my parents' home in Madrid, Spain. Uh, this is the room, the bedroom, where I grew up. It's next, next to my parents' room. And uh, every time I go back, I take a picture of this, uh, of this site. What is interesting is not only the picture itself, what I see, or the gardens of my parents' place, etc. What is interesting is what is behind, what is behind that tree. Uh, back in the day, when uh, my parents moved there in the 1970s, uh, the trees were much smaller, so you could see, actually, the Sierra of Madrid behind that tree. And right there in the middle of the circle was this. So every morning when I would wake up, when there was no fog or pollution, I would look at this. I would look at that cross, actually. And yeah, I always kept wondering what that was. And uh, of course, as soon as I had a little bit of a use of a reason, I asked my parents what that was. And of course, they explained me what that was. Um, that is. Francisco Franco's mausoleum. Francisco Franco, I'm not going to enter into history, and somebody else will let us know a little bit better tonight, but he was a fascist dictator that ruled Spain since 1939 after a coup d'etat and, um, and after having deleted the lives of many, uh, many Spaniards. That red or that yellow uh, circle is the place where his tomb is located. He ordered the construction of this mausoleum. In the beginning, actually, it wasn't meant to be his mausoleum. This was meant to be a monument to reconciliation between the two camps that fought a war in Spain between 1936 and 1939. He decided that not only those um, that belonged to his side would be buried there, but that everybody that had participated in that war would be, uh, uh, would be buried there. About 33,000 people were moved into that mountain in order to, let's say, talk about reconciliation. But of course, as I think that everybody can understand that this was not a, anything, I mean, anything further than that, than reconciliation. This was a fascist monument uh, built by a fascist dictator who was finally moved there. Apparently, they, it wasn't his decision to move there, but in the end, uh, he was buried in this, in this place. He followed the construction of the, of the monument. He really enjoyed bringing foreigners, all those foreign politicians that, that uh, would support him to visit the, uh, the construction site. But what we need to know is about the stories behind, no? about all those prisoners of war that were made uh, work there uh, and uh, were actually treated as slaves. And it is difficult to understand why many people from the other camp, which didn't wish to be moved here, there, were actually moved there till the end. 33,000 people, more or less, are buried in that mountain together with uh, Francisco Franco. So 
this is how the place looks now. It's a really an interesting place to visit. The landscape is, is gorgeous. The architecture, we could say it's also gorgeous, but I don't know if that's what matters here. That's his tomb. This is the tomb of a fascist dictator that has been there until one year ago. For me, that was always an anomaly, and I would wake up in the morning and try to ask my parents why that was happening. Uh, of course, my parents never supported this, uh, this regime. Uh, on the other hand, they spent the whole youth fighting, fighting against uh, Franco's regime. Thousands of people gathered in 1975 when the dictator died uh, to see the uh, corpse being, uh, being taken into this mausoleum. And uh, still, people in Spain can worship and uh, do the fascist salute in front of his tomb. This picture was taken one year ago, right before Finally, his tomb uh, or his corpse or his uh, um, casket was taken out of this place. I don't know what's going to happen with this, uh, with this mausoleum. I don't know what's going to happen with this site. I think that I have more questions than answers, and I hope that tonight we can all speak about what to do with these certain contested uh, sites, monuments, buildings, and pieces of urban fabric. So tonight, uh, the session will be moderated by Evelyn van Rijswijk. Uh, she will also give word to our speakers. Uh, we have together uh, tonight with us Karel Loef, uh, Marina otero Bertier, Koshe Spitz, and Alexander Stanicic. So um, I'm going to just give the word to Evelyn. She will moderate the panel. And I hope that we have an interesting discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Evelyn. The floor is yours. Thank you, Javier. Um, so welcome, in the, everyone in the audience, everyone at home. Um, so we're going to talk about contested heritage. And um, we've had a lot of discussions recently, a lot of statues that were uh, taken down. Uh, and um, that's why the public debate is, uh, is alive about this topic. So what do we do with contested heritage? Do we demolish monuments, buildings? Do we preserve them? Um, do we build counter monuments? Um, how do we redesign the built uh, environment? That's the question tonight. Um, and can we redesign the built environment that brings up so many painful memories? Four speakers will give a short talk uh, of five minutes uh, as a case study to um, show us, okay, what kind of contested heritage do we have? Um, what are the specific problems with this contested heritage and what to do with it? Um, after each talk, I will ask them some questions and then together we'll join in a panel discussion. Uh, and also people here today in the audience can ask a question um, uh, at the speakers. Um, so enjoy it and I'll give the floor to the first speaker. There's a lot of war monuments uh, in the uh, case studies. The first speaker is Karel Loef. He is director of Erfgoedvereniging Bond Heemschut, in my best Dutch. One of the oldest and biggest private heritage organizations in the Netherlands with 5,000 members and 150 volunteers. It's really impressive. And the goal of the organization is to protect built heritage and uh, cultural landscape. He's also trained as an architectural historian and specialized in industrial heritage. His case study will be the wall of mustard. Karel Loef. Yes, thank you, Evelyn, in the back of, of me to uh, keep me in time. I will uh, give a short intro introduction of what we are, well, that said, what we are, we are an uh, NGO, an, uh, a volunteer organization. Bond Heemschut is founded in 1911. And of course, we have indeed 5,000 members, private members, who are uh, willing to preserve heritage. And we started um, in uh, 1911 when there was no heritage law, when there was no protection at all, when uh, the government was not that interested to keep heritage alive. Um, nowadays, we have um, a law, we have uh, communities who have tried to protect heritage, uh, but still there are a lot of uh, items which are not well enough preserved. So that's what we actually try to do, to get heritage preserved and um, give it a good new future. Um, that's also in our name, 
Heem is our own environment, and schutten means protecting, protecting your own environment by uh, keeping it uh, the heritage alive, as you can say. Before I come to the case study, I will talk a little bit about two items which are contacted, uh, contested in at the moment uh, that were, were an item. This is really the start of the organization. This design was uh, uh, not so much appreciated by the founders of our organization. Nowadays, 100 years later, it's still there in a historical city of Monacodam, 17th century uh, uh, protected town. Um, and now we should preserve it. We are not willing to take it down. Uh, so the first idea in 1909 was to tear it down. And now we say it is really a monument. And you can say that about a lot of uh, heritage and the heritage which uh, a lot of heritage doesn't have a political uh, um, uh, issue behind it. Uh, sometimes heritage is also uh, forgotten or uh, they tear it down because it's uh, a bad remembrance like industrial complexes where uh, the workers were not well paid uh, or this uh, stinking gutter which is now the foremost tourist attraction in Sertogenbos and is well restored, preserved and is not stinking any more. Um, a recent form of contested heritage is heritage uh, which is also not political but it's a social sort of heritage. This uh, uh, snack bar uh, where you could, uh, 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 which also figured in a, in a movie uh, and, and it was really a, a sort of heritage of the youth in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, so we pleaded to get this on a heritage list but we didn't succeed. So everybody thinks this is a real remembrance of that youth culture. Um, I self-started after my training by, uh, with the research on um, heritage built by the Germans in the Netherlands, actually. Uh, and these were uh, airfields which were uh, uh, there because of the English uh, uh, fighters who came above the Netherlands flying to Germany to, to try to bump uh, uh, the Germans. Um, the, the Nazis built uh, uh, specific airfields and they tried to uh, to, to shut the, the English warriors down from that airfields and afterwards they were uh, just uh, reused by the Dutch army and after that uh, when the army left the question was about what to do with it. Um, we made a selection and uh, there was a huge discussion then uh, because it was a German heritage. In fact it was on a on a national uh, yeah, Dutch ground and what to do with it. Now we have one of the most important airfields, uh, which is Airfield Dalen, which is a protected national monument. Uh, talking about uh, some other items, this is one of the radar, uh, uh, um, uh, the radar things which we have, and that's uh, uh, still there, it's used for asteroids. The Muur van Mussert is an, uh, a wall which is in Lunteren, and it was built after this uh, Thingstetter, which is sort of an open air theater, and this was uh, a Nazi system of getting the people who were a member of the party together and uh, to keep them motivated. In the Netherlands, we had the Hagespraken by Anton Mussert, and he built and aided this wall. And this wall was there, he had there some speeches, he held some speeches, and after the war, after the war um, which uh, um, ended in 1945, this was used as a camping site. The site is still visible on the uh, pictures from 1945, and this was a few years ago. And then the owner of the camping site said, I want to tear the wall down. Um, that's when we came into action and we said, well, we tried to get this wall protected, though it is contested heritage. And a lot of people signed a petition, uh, a lot of histori historians, a lot of important people, uh, uh, scientists, writers, etc. Um, and other people said it's fake news, you shouldn't protect this as heritage. In the end, uh, the Minister of Culture um, was, uh, in, uh, came to Lunteren and she decided to uh, uh, make this wall a protected monument. Not so much to uh, give it a status as real heritage in, in a way of being very proud of it, but more as what the Germans say, a maanmaal. Just to remember that there was another side of the war and that you should, should keep this in mind, that this could happen if there are a lot of more, a lot of more people uh, 
uh, with uh, um, well ideas which um, get a, a, a further ground to to go uh, and to, uh, to 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 spread it. Um, interesting to see is that a um, the, one of the parties said, "Oh, we are very proud that our minister of culture uh, uh, made this uh, a state-listed monument. So vote for us." And um, well, that's it actually. Um, there's a lot to discuss about this wall. Now it's still not renovated, the place is still there, uh, but the discussion uh, has faded and everybody sees now that this is part of our history which we should keep and just um, um, uh, make it a, a, a good site for remembrance what is the, the other side of, of war. Five minutes. Thank you, thank you, Carl. <laughs> Take a seat. Put yeah. the clicker somewhere uh, over there. Yeah. Uh, I have some questions uh, for you. And uh, you can think about this question already while you're cleaning the clicker or your hands. <laughs> Corona people. Um, was it a problem, the wall? Was it really contested or was everyone forgotten it, it was actually there? Well, the wall was uh, actually forgotten um, until um, the owner wanted to tear it down. Um, and at that point, uh, the local community said, okay, we're not going to protect it because then it was very much contested because it was a local site. However, people did know it, didn't want to know about it, uh, forgot it because it was a camping site. It was used for 50 years for another, another purpose. Um, and then the discussion was, um, well, if we're going to protect this, this could be a, a monument where a lot of, well, neo-fascist people would come, come to, to gather because they're very uh, interested in that part of history. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, when we looked at it uh, and the history of it, uh, Mussert was really a follower of, uh, of the Nazis, but he didn't really succeed in, in making that real status which he want, uh, because there was only two times there's these gatherings and there was not enough money to complete the wall. Um, so there are different stories about this, this place. And um, w was it used as a, a memory site for people who still have Nazi sympathies? No. Um, when the uh, Minister of Culture came uh, over, uh, the site was opened up um, and uh, we were a little bit worried that there might be some gatherings. However, uh, we saw two people which we, well, might had an idea that they could have some sympathies, but they were really, well, uh, well, not provoking, nothing at all. So um, there's not really any form of uh, um, remembrance or uh, new ideas about it. It's just the wall, which is there. Yeah. yeah. W will it be a place where you can get some information on, on fascism, on the NSB, on Mussert, or what kind of memory site will it be? Well, that's the idea. Um, it's still owned by the camping owner, um, and the idea is that uh, when it's sold or uh, taken over by uh, another organization, the idea is to make it a remembrance site where the, the complete story uh, will be told. Um, so then you get a good idea of what are the good things, what are the bad things, uh, what, what, which things happened, uh, uh, and, and well, of course you can um, make it a real remembrance site yeah. with all the different stories. Thank you. This is a, a great example, I think, of how to preserve it and contextualize it. So thank you, Carol, for this first first ca yeah. uh, um, case case study. Um, we'll continue with Kosha Spitz. Uh, she studied history and holds a master's degree in World Heritage Studies, advisor heritage and culture at the National UNESCO Commission, and she advises the Dutch government on the implementation of the UNESCO conventions, in particular the World Heritage Convention and the 1970 Convention Against Illicit Trafficking. A lot of conventions. Um, and she coordinates various projects relating to conservation, safety, and security issues. Uh, and her case study will be the concentration and extermination camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Koosje Spitz. Don't forget the clicker. Yeah. Thank you very, very much. Um, so let's see. 
Okay, so today I am, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, World Heritage Sites that are associated with recent conflicts. And um, it's actually a discussion which is very recent, um, uh, or at least it's very contemporary at the moment, um, within uh, the realm of World Heritage, also within uh, the discussions that the World Heritage Con uh, Committee has. Um, uh, however, it has been on the table already um, uh, for many, many years, and that's also a reason why I decided to discuss it today. Um, first of all, UNESCO has as a mandate, since um, wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. So that's the overall mission of UNESCO, and it really is about peace building. Um, trying to get a dialogue uh, started, trying to have mutual respect, um, trying to um, overcome conflicts by uh, sharing ideas, knowledge, uh, knowledge but also uh, cultural expressions. So that's the basic idea behind the, the, the organization UNESCO. Um, the World Heritage Convention in itself is one of the most known conventions of UNESCO and um, um, it is also something that is, uh, is growing in its understanding um, because we're learning about a lot about how we perceive heritage through the World Heritage Convention and all the discuss discussions around it. So the idea of World Heritage that um, it's the designation um, of places on earth that are of outstanding universal value to humanity and as such have been inscribed on the World Heritage List to be protected for future generations to be appreciated and enjoyed. So I wanted to emphasize this because these are important words when you talk about World Heritage. So preservation, appreciation, enjoyment. Um, if you look at the list, there are various commemorative places that are inscribed on this list. So we look at places that are connected, for example, to slavery, but we also have places that are, are connected uh, to the Second World War. Um, um, also more recently to, for example, um, the uh, Balkan Wars where we have the um, Bridge of Mostar or the, the old center of, um, historic center of, of the city of Mostar inscribed, but you see them in all different shapes and forms. You have the Roman island, um, uh, prison um, or the whole island including the prison. Also these are places that are commemorative. Um, of course Hiroshima um, here um, which was a peace memorial as an example as well. So there are 1121 places currently on this, on this World Heritage List and it is growing each year. Today, I wanted to mention the case of Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is the German Nazi concentration and extermination camp. It was inscribed in 1979 under Criterium 6. So if we look at the outstanding universal value that the World Heritage Committee has used for inscription on the list, um, I just wanted to emphasize a few things. So it was the largest of concentration camp complexes created by Nazi German regime. And the remains of the two camps were inscribed as evidence of this inhumane um, effort to deny human dignity to groups. But it's also a, a vivid testimony to the murderous nature of anti-Semitic and racist Nazi policy. The reason why I wanted to mention evidence and vivid testimony, because these are very strong words when you talk about commemorative heritage. So if you look a little bit further into the, the case, you see that the in criteria for inscription was that it was associated to events. Um, nowadays, we want this criterion to be con uh, connected to another criterion. So we have 10, but this time it was separate. And it says that it's a key place of memory for the whole of humankind. So key place of memory for the whole of humankind. And it's a place of our collective memory of this dark chapter in the history of humanity. A transmission to younger generations and a sign of warning. So these are really strong wordings. And at the same time, there was back then when it was inscribed, but still today, a growing feeling of discomfort towards conflict-related nominations and inscriptions. So this was recently pointed out in a, a discussion paper by the International Council on Museums and Sites. I'm just going to mention four conclusions in um, this uh, paper that I want you to think about at home. So sometimes a key message is defined as a formal 
national message. So inscription can be a key message, but also a formal national message. Does that fit on, an, uh, on a, a list which is supposed to be common? The message of peace and reconciliation have not been heeded through this inscription, according to ICOMOS. And sites associated with recent conflicts cannot be, uh, com cannot be accommodated by the key concepts of world heritage. So that's interesting as well. So the convention and these inscriptions do not align. And it doesn't stand for the positive message of the outstanding universal value and the peace mandate of UNESCO. So interestingly enough, apparently, and this is where I close, I wonder, is there room within the World Heritage List that apparently has to be, um, has a positive connotation um, and still can it address painful memories? And if so, can the World Heritage List be a vehicle or should actually all forms of political tension be avoided? So this is a question I'm going to put forward here and I, um, I'm looking forward to your responses. Uh, well, yeah, let me, yeah, put the clicker over there. And um, I'll ask you your first, your own first question. Is there room within the World Heritage List to address painful memories? Or should it be called the World Contested Heritage List? Should you just make two lists? One World Heritage List, you can enjoy it, beautiful heritage, and then the one Contested Heritage List. Sorry, all has to be corona proof. Uh, it's a new experience for me as well. Great. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so you're asking my own question back. That's interesting. Um, well, uh, first of all, the thing is that uh, there are sites that already are inscribed on this list. So apparently the World Heritage Committee at that time saw, thought it was a good idea to have places that are considered to be um, commemorative or that have a certain darker aspects that should be on this list. Um, and at the same time, it's also something that uh, feelings can be evolving. And the question is, if you put it on a list, do you still create enough room for a constant reflection on these particular events? Because they are often related to events and they're often related to particular groups within um, either within a country or, or on a larger scale in, this, in the case of Auschwitz-Birkenau um, on a worldwide level. But do you can you have this continuous room for reflection? And I think that's a, a little bit more difficult because there's always a certain fixedness to world heritage. This outstanding universal value is something which is being uh, uh, literally written down and fixed uh, at the time of inscription. So does, does that then still... Um, uh, the question is, can you still continue to reflect if something is written down? If, if something's on the list, is it there forever? Or do you reevaluate every 10, 20, 30 years? Um, it's supposed to be there forever. Uh, we've seen two uh, delistings, um, uh, but it's something that you wish to avoid. Um, I, I would always say, um, in a sense, it's, it's kind of like a, a marriage. You want it to, be, to last forever. I mean, that's... Uh... Um, one other thing in your uh, talk was, uh, you mentioned that a vivid memory and evidence was important to put it on the list in the first place, right? Is it used for other contested heritage, heritage sites as well? Um, uh, yes, I mean, each site has its own description um, uh, and its own OUV, as we would say. But uh, definitely, I mean, you see places like uh, Hiroshima, for example, which is also um, uh, as a proof of the destructive uh, nature that we as a human humans have um, um, and as a, in a sense you also want it to be about reconciliation um, but as, as ICOMOS has referred in its discussion paper often this phase of reconciliation is not being reached uh, through inscription and I think that can be problematic um, and um, I'm not sure if then the World Heritage List would be the answer to reach that goal. Let's uh, also discuss this uh, when we're in the panel discussion all together. Thank you very much, Koshi Spitz, for this case study and, um, well, to um, let us know a little bit more about how this works with the UNESCO World Heritage List. The third case study, or case studies, I must say, uh, will be presented by Marina Otero-Versier. 
an architect based in Rotterdam. She's director of research at het Nieuwe Instituut, again in my best touch. And uh, she leads the Memory and Oblivion Research Project on Ideology, Memory and Monuments. And since September 2020, I read you also hold the position of head of the Social Design Masters at Design Academy Eindhoven. And you do a lot of more things, but uh, I only give you a short uh, uh, summary. Um, you won't present one case study, but share several samples, uh, examples from Spain that exemplify the complexity of memory culture in Spain. Marina, give her a warm hand. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a warm hand, it's great, thank you. <laughs> Interesting choreography, this one. Yeah, here I am. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna continue in a way the story that Javier uh, mentioned today, um, and is the story of historical memory in Spain. This is the equestrian statue of Francisco Franco, the dictator, in Ferrol, that is the city in Spain where he was born. And this statue endured all sort of vandalism and even an attack with explosives until the municipality decided to remove it from the public space that was the main public space in the city. So it was uh, uh, going through that uh, town like a parade with people following it, uh, singing, like playing music and calling like assassin uh, to the statue of the dictator. And it was put in uh, custody in the military museum in, in the space of the harbor in Ferrol. But it was uh, still uh, visible to the public, something that in many cases it was against the historical memory law that was passed by the uh, leftist government uh, some years ago. So after some protests, it was again relocated inside a warehouse in uh, Ferrol. But something happened that was like it was covered by a textile and with there was some wind the textile was uncovering the statue and many people started to take photographs. So the internet was continuously being plagued with these uh, images of Franco. Again, going against the memory, uh, historical memory law that uh, doesn't allow to share uh, images of the fascism in Spain. So they tried to avoid this uh, act again by creating an architectural uh, solution that was like, putting the statue inside this um, metal box in the military uh, space. What is interesting is that while in many other countries uh, monuments are destroyed by direct action by citizens in Spain, there is a continuous act of burial and unearthing of monuments. And actually, uh, this battle is fought above and below the ground because as in many cities are still like uh, uh, struggling to take monuments uh, off, and putting them in warehouses or storages, etc. There are many other uh, citizens' initiatives to actually unbury and exhumate the bodies of the Republicans who were murdered and killed during the civil war, but also the dictatorship. And this is the case. Um, what is uh, interesting is that despite the memory law, um, the successive uh, conservative governments in Spain didn't allocate funding to do these exhumations. So it has been done something by uh, associations, by people, even uh, foreigners, who have been supporting uh, these attempts to identify the victims. Um, this is, for example, in the Guadalajara um, Cemetery. Most of these uh, victims are in mass graves, and Spain is actually the second country in the world with more uh, mass graves that are still to be opened. This is uh, happening all over the territory. These mass graves are over the territory, and this also these attempts to reconsider, uh, maybe resignify uh, uh, spaces that were associated with fascism. For, for instance, this uh, Panopticon-style prison for political prisoners in Lugo that now is a cultural center. And uh, all this task is to talk about the crimes of fascism and remember the victims. And, uh, do projects pro-democracy. But you can see this is, for instance, one uh, place of a mass grave that has not been exhuma exhumated yet. And the neighbors are trying to, to do the tramits. And these are many different statues that have been removed in the last years. 
always having some supporters uh, chanting like uh, Viva Franco. Interestingly enough, um, you know, there's one of the stories that even like have some humor. So uh, one of the statues of Franco was relocated to a warehouse, but in order to make it enter in the warehouse, the left uh, leg of the dictator has to be cut. And the left and the horse uh, were inside this warehouse until they were okay, relocated again, and suddenly the head was also disappeared. And in a recent exhibition in Barcelona, they were displaying these symbols in a, in a way to criticize, also to have a conversation about historical memory. But that created also a lot of uh, encounters. And uh, finally, the statue didn't uh, survive. Another example is perhaps hilarious, but it uh, makes how uh, citizens can actually resignify spaces even uh, in different ways. This is how the house of uh, Francisco Franco in Ferrol has been become now a Pokestop. Spo a stop. Um, so you can go there and uh, collect eggs from Pokemon. And yeah, here we have Del Valle Los Caídos. Um, imposing uh, its presence over the territory and asking for silence. And silence is what has been prevailing in Spain over this uh, situation. And in fact, it has been difficult to have conversations about the usage or the demolition or the uh, resignification of these uh, monuments. Even in the School of Architecture, my attempts to bring this conversation forward, I encountered that even uh, students, very young students, were still feel that they could not talk openly uh, about these questions. So that's why it's important to have the possibility to discuss them. Until recently, until the Franco was uh, exhumated from uh, Del Valle Los Caídos, there were still people praying uh, in, his, uh, in front of his tomb. And this is something that I wanted to uh, talk about, like what architects can do. And I refer to uh, Ket Glass, is one architect that is scholar, that for me has been a reference in how to deal with architecture. And uh, from the point of view also technical uh, studies, trying to uh, culturally and technically argue for the demolition of certain uh, uh, monuments. And I'm not gonna read it because it's too long, but you should check online how he describes what is a monument, what is heritage, what is culture, and how actually these uh, spaces on these monuments don't apply to be preserved. And he proposes instead to have them demolished with a cathartic act as a artwork almost in public space. This, yeah, I'm gonna end, but just showing some of his works also in attempt to not only demolish certain monuments, uh, but also create new monuments for the victims, the Republican victims. Very simple, humble ones, to be honest, but important ones. And something that is touching me as well is that it's not only about monuments built in stone, but also uh, praising the memory of those who uh, lost their lives to support democracy, to fight for democracy and freedom. And that's why for him, these are also monuments, like the books with the histories and the writings of the people who died for democracy are published and are treated as monuments as well. And this is a series that now we are doing at the new institute that is called Monuments. And next uh, week we have the last event and this is also my way to contribute uh, or to continue to contribute into this debate. So thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to do the Corona dance again. You can think about my first question <laughs> already. Um, thank you for the, cr for the creative ways of dealing with monuments. You mentioned some uh, very creative ideas. And I was wondering, what's your own favorite idea or a way to deal with these contestant monuments? Yeah, that's the question I've been trying to ask myself. And in the case of Spain, I want to try to respond because uh, it was until quite recently uh, not possible to uh, still discuss or persecute certain crimes uh, committed by fascist forces because it was the amnesty law uh, that happened in the transition towards democracy. I think the uh, foundations of Spain were very unstable. You can see how I, I refer to that like being so many mass graves. So in other places, perhaps, 
the presence of these monuments, like what happens with Mussolini in, Ita in Italy and so on, can be a present in the public space. But in the case of Spain, their mere presence is very complicated because it's a still reminding of the lack of support to uh, identify victims, the lack of uh, support in um, you know, revisit the crimes and have a, actually a public debate. So I will say that these monuments indeed, many of them have to be demolished. In the case of the Valley, Valley of the Fallen, it's impossible because, because of the conditions of the construction that actually was very bad constructed. Um, many of the bodies that were buried there has merged with the walls themselves. So if you will be about to demolish, you will actually be demolishing as well, you know, many of the bodies of the victims uh, that are there. So it's very convoluted architecture. I will say as well that if at some point the Spanish society has a common history, is able to create certain form of common ground, uh, perhaps the presence of monuments wouldn't be that important. And what will be important is to have a built environment that reflects the ideals that the Republicans, for instance, fighted for. That it was a more affordable uh, space, inclusive space, and many other like conditions that are so important that the fascism took away for so long. Yeah. So some monuments we have to demolish, some we can't, or is not morally uh, right to do so. Um, what kind of creative way to deal with monuments uh, do you prefer, or should we even build monuments? I, I think the yeah I don't think that we should build monuments. I don't think it's the uh, the way in which uh, a celebra celebration should should go. I think I'm more interested in saying if I fight if I'm fighting for these ideals, what will be as an architect the architecture that will support those ideals, not as a symbolic gesture but actually a structural one. So I'm more interested in thinking uh, of a monument that is a yeah a livable, accessible uh, city, for instance. It sounds rhetoric, but I want to think that way. Yeah, I, like uh, in the lines, you, the many lines, who, who came up with it, the name again? Uh, yeah, it's Joseph Ketglas. Yeah, and one of them was that a monument is not architecture. Well, he was uh, talking about a particular monument, and he was claiming that that monument in particular was not architecture. That monument was not heritage because it was not representing the ideals uh, that a society wants to preserve for future generations. So he gives a list of uh, you know, points that could be used in a commission of heritage as well to make, you know, to advocate for the maintenance or removal of the, uh, monuments. And I found it very disparaging how architects could also use their knowledge to participate in those debates, in these debates, but also in commissions or in building the new future. I thought it was interesting, you know, is it is a monument architecture? Could we say, well, it's not, it's just a symbol for something and yeah, maybe not Yeah, he said that it's not architecture because it doesn't have um, interior space. It was just like a construction, but yeah, it's, it's kind of also a, a very sophisticated way of making arguments around that particular piece. Yeah, thank you for these um, uh, interesting uh, examples. Uh, we're going to close off with the case study of Alexander Stanicic. You can already clean clickers and everything while I introduce you. Um, and um, he's an architect and assistant professor here at TU Delft Faculty of Architecture and the Built Environment. He was the co-editor of the book War Diaries, Design After the Deconstruction of Art and Architecture, and is the author of a forthcoming book, Transition Herbicide. I'm, I have to speak uh, faster. Post-war construction in post-socialist Belgrade. And his um, case study will be the ruins of the Yugoslav Ministry of Defense that was bombed by NATO in 1999. The floor is yours. Thank you, Evelyn, for a really wonderful introduction. And thank you all for uh, organizing this event and for inviting me. I like how all of our case studies are really uh, personal and I think that the only way that we can talk about heritage is that we really feel this deep connection with it. So my case study is not different. I will just quickly go through this slide. Today I will be talking about uh, the general staff building that was uh, built by architect Nikola Dobrovic in, uh, from 1953 to 1965. This building was um, 
built as a home of the Yugoslav People's Army that exited the Second World War victorious. And uh, as you can see, there are many symbolisms in this building that associate to this victory. Uh, Nikola Dobrovic himself was uh, a partisan, participant in this battle. And many, uh, when this building was built, many instantly recognized this symbolism of uh, Battle of Sutjeska. Battle of Sutjeska was uh, one of the most important events in uh, uh, Yugoslav on, of the Second World War in Yugoslav territory. It was the event that symbolically marked the beginning of socialist Yugoslavia and uh, in some ways roots of this building stem to that event as well. So that you can see this void hovering uh, above the street that in a way symbolizes the canyon of, of Sutjeska as a symbol of victory of Yugoslavia over fascism. So right from the beginning this building had powerful symbolism related, related to that event. Sadly enough, this is the building where uh, all, all uh, Yugoslav wars of 1990s were conceived uh, by Milosevic regime and probably because of that it was bombed by NATO in 1999 uh, at the beginning of uh, Kosovo conflict. <laughs> Ruins of Generalstab persist until today. Uh, in 2005, the building was protected by the Belgrade Institute for Protection of Cultural Heritage as a, as a cultural heritage. It was protected in ruinous state, and this caused many consequences for the, the destiny of this building. Well, first of all, uh, because of this, there were certain limitations in reconstruction of the building, and therefore building could not be sold to investors. Uh, the building is still owned by the Serbian armed forces who gradually started to dismantle the building piece by piece under the pretext of safety for, for uh, passers-by. But also because of this, uh, these ruins of this building be, uh, became a spontaneous monument to, to NATO bombing. And I would argue that today it is one of the most photographed tourist places in Belgrade. Parts of this building are still being used by Serbian armed forces, by Serbian Ministry of Defense, who is also using this, um, let's say, huge billboard to cover the traces of bombing, to cover the traces of this inability to defend itself against NATO. And as you can see here, a uh, description on this billboard says, the one who dares can, the one who knows no fear moves forward. A, a bit ironical, I would say. But of course, reconstruction proposals are missing for, for obvious reason, and the only reconstruction proposals uh, uh, coming for this building are actually produced by students from all over the world. Here we can see one example from the Bartlett School, School of Architecture, produced in 2010. Um, students from Politecnico di Milano, uh, accidentally my students as well produced this uh, reconstruction proposal in 2014 and of course there are let's say more more comical uh, attempts to, to propose some kind of solution for this building um, and all of these proposals are pointing to the symbolism of the building not not the uh, not the architectural qualities but what this building actually represents but I would like to suggest and this actually goes quite well to, to previous presentation, I would like to suggest that artistic approaches can propose different interpretations, different readings 
of this building that can actually create this common ground on which we can build a common, shared, and hopefully better future. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, yeah, you want to see, applaud him. Uh, you can leave it right there, or maybe, uh, or click it to a neutral slide, doesn't matter. Uh, you can think about the question, what would you do with it as an architect? Uh, that's a, a, a very good question, and I will try to answer in a, in a political way, in a diplomatic way, because many architects who are um, uh, in, in Belgrade trying to protect this building are actually advocating to return building in the previous state, which actually is not that possible anymore because the documentation is missing, and uh, there is also a veil of secrecy around this building, so it is not possible to return building in previous state. I would like to propose that actually um, architects and maybe urban planners should be given a chance to redesign this building so that new layers of meaning are added. And I would actually like to avoid direct sim symbolic associations and maybe uh, propose some abstract forms that would allow these multiple readings. And I think that, what, that that is one of the advantages, for example, of memorial that were built in Yugoslavia after the Second World War, because they were abstract in a way, and because of that, direct associations were avoided. And at least to me, this is my personal opinion, I have to say, that seems as the best way to continue. Yeah. And when you would start a project, what would be the, the most difficult part of redesigning it, do you think? What, what will you encounter when you will do that? Well, I know, for example, that uh, the concrete problem with these ruins are that, uh, st statically speaking, this is not a safe construction. So you really have to be careful what kind of interventions you're proposing that are actually possible uh, there on the site. And I know that many attempts were made before to, to make that, those kind of calculations, and they all failed. So um, I would say that in this particular case, it is the, 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 what is actually feasible on the ground that is making the, the problem. Yeah. Um, could you say that whatever you do with it, it will be a political statement? Keeping it is a political statement, renovating it is a political statement? This is a beautiful question because I think it, it really opens, opens it the opens discussion. It opens the panel discussion, yeah. opens well discussion because I was listening carefully uh, previous presentations and I would say that almost all heritage is political. It is really difficult to find a heritage that is not. And, and even, even if you manage to find a, a heritage that is not political, it can become political because it, 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 at any point in time it can get contested. So uh, I would say that the answer to that is that politics is always involved and, and especially when heritage is contested and mind you not burdened or difficult but contested which means actively contested which means that there is no consensus what it means and in many cases especially in Yugoslavia especially in Mostar that is, that is still the case. We have architects, uh, architectural historian, historian. Um, maybe a first response on the uh, examples or the case studies everyone gave. Um, what was your first response to these other case studies? How do you look at it as a historian? Um, well, uh, what I, I think it's the, uh, what, what I found striking is that um, in in most cases the uh, the events were connected directly to a lot of emotions and emotions that you cannot discard, um, uh, and I think the strength of having places visible or invisible, um, but they, that they keep us um, critical, um, but also that we kind of try to keep uh, to learn lessons from it because when it's inside you're kind of forced to think of it um, to a certain extent. And I think that's also in the case of Auschwitz-Birkenau, um, there will never be a way that you could ever properly reflect the atrocities that have taken place there. That's just in unimaginable. 
but if it wouldn't be there, would you still be able to have so many people uh, learning that this can never again happen, that there's no way that we would want this as a humanity to happen? And I think that's always the struggle. If you keep it, can you then still learn from it? If you take it away, would it then just also be out of sight, out of uh, heart? Carol? Um, yeah, what I see is in the recent um, history, there are a lot of emotions still in, in certain countries uh, regarding their recent wars or fights or uh, especially what you said about the law is still there that there are no images or no objects or relics allowed. Um, and, and when I refer to the Netherlands, we are a little bit further away from the Second World War. Uh, we have different topics like slavery and, and statues uh, of contested heritage. So there are new problems evolving. Um, so the interesting thing is to uh, comment it properly and to, to get some distance uh, uh, and, and to see the other way around. Um, that's the best way to, to um, relate to these objects. But that's always difficult because groups are having some kind of emotion, feelings or, or, or ideas about this. Yeah. Is that also maybe, I'm in the middle here, the difference between um, the, the case studies you gave, it's, it's a little bit further away, the uh, Second World War, and well, Franco died in 75, right? And 1999, it's maybe sometimes too fresh um, to discuss it. Could you say that? Um, I guess, um, no, it's not, it's not too fresh to discuss it. The problem is that there has been, perhaps in certain countries, a systematic silencing of uh, certain parts of the population because in, in the case, for instance, in Spain, we are talking about a civil war so that means that very like a large part of the population will be supporting a particular understanding of history while the other might be like not even were made part of that history and has been silenced. So I think the problem is that it's very long time ago. I mean, the, the civil war happened 36, 39. We are into 20 yeah. and it's still this question resonates. So it's something like, as, as Javier was saying, Franco, uh, his uh, corpse was removed from this uh, monument that is one of the most visited monuments in Spain um, last year. So that's striking that actually happens now. But I guess that it, certain things need more time to heal. Um, and in the case of Spain, it's still not completely the case that we can discuss these topics without any uh, problem or without uh, having a very strong emotion, as, as you are mentioning. Alexander? I would agree that it is not too soon, because let's not forget that we, we have a new generation of young people, of, of kids who are growing up learning this history. So it is important that we start a dialogue where, it, where uh, uh, the, the, the legacy of this burden heritage will be, will be clear to them so that they learn um, this history that will, that will be based for their future. So this is not something that can be avoided and simply uh, we cannot propose that waiting long enough for a proper time to discuss these things is a good solution. I mean, I can give you numerous examples where, where new generations are more radicalized than their parents because the history that they are learning is still contested. So th this is why uh, discussion is important and conversation about burden history is equally important. Let's dive a little bit deeper into this discussion uh, in all these case studies and, and how this discussion is also uh, evolving maybe. Um, uh, who is a part of this discussion? Uh, how do young people look at it? Um, is it discussed in parliament? Is it, how, how does it go, th this discussion? Well, I can talk about my experiences. I mean, I don't want to, to uh, make assumption on, on a global scale, but uh, in the context that I know quite well, which is the context of former Yugoslavia, uh, children are learning these histories from, from their parents and their friends, and they see and they repeat what they see on television, which is politicians constantly fighting and challenging historical events. I'm talking about, for example, 
what is happening in Bosnia is the, the most obvious example because society there is pretty much divided and they are learning two histories and they are having two uh, different representations about the same events that happened there. So lack of dialogue there is uh, reflected in how these young generations are understanding their own history and it's, it is also contested. And, and does this lead to people protesting in front of the uh, Ministry of Defense? We have to keep it, or how do they deal with these contested heritage sites? Well, uh, in case of Belgrade, no, because uh, in, in Belgrade, um, uh, let's say, uh, people are, are trying to, to move on, and, and Belgrade's so Serbian society is not that divided as Bosnian society. Um, but uh, I would also like to say, and maybe this is something that, um, that you, you can maybe answer, um, I think that it is also important when we are reconstructing uh, heritage architecture, and especially when we are reconstructing sites such as Mostar, Mostar, old Mostar Bridge, that all parties who are affected by this heritage are included in conversation. Uh, because uh, I have a feeling, and correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, that these kind of initiatives that are coming from top down, that I'm not convinced that they are uh, engaging with every community and, and, and with every uh, person who is affected by that heritage. Because I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring this case of uh, old Mostar Bridge once again, because I know that situation there quite well. And I know that um, there were communities in Mostar who did not approve reconstruction of old bridge, and they did not see it as their heritage. And reconstruction of, Mortar, of Mostar bridge did not reconcile uh, belligerent parties in Mostar. I know that for a fact. So I think that it is important, sorry for taking maybe too much time, I th really think that it is important to, to understand local politics and to engage with them with, uh, with, with an open hand. Without yeah. that, we cannot have like one, one solution fits all. I think it's a, it's a really important contribution to this discussion. Kosha, uh, it is on the World Heritage side, isn't it? Um, it's, it's, that's true, it's, um, it's uh, not just the bridge, but also the, the other parts of the historic uh, center. It was actually inscribed, I think, in 2005, so that a few years um, after it was uh, demolished and then reconstructed. Um, I think what should be what is interesting in this case is that you're giving a, um, um, a heritage status um, to a certain place. In this case, you give it a, a worldwide status. Um, I think, regardless whether it's it's the, uh, the, the, the city of Mostar or uh, perhaps uh, a place in the Netherlands, or um, at the end of the day, it's a national state that puts forward a um, nomination. And I think uh, this is also the complexity. So if you have a system in which it's um, state members of UNESCO putting forward nominations that even though on paper we would always say that there should be a carrying capacity, there should be local involvement, at the end of the day it's always a national um, uh, uh, a government that is, is the one that is putting forward. And often you cannot see um, uh, a participation in a multilateral organization loose from its national agendas. Um, and there's a lot of politics that takes place, and I think the World Heritage Convention and the committee in itself is not um, in an exception when it comes to uh, uh, the world's clashing or perhaps a, a lack of involvement of, of parties that you would from a heritage perspective um, rather see involved uh, in, in this to have a, a, a full picture. Marina, um, how would you say the discussion in Spain evolved? Also because I was kind of struck with this law that you cannot uh, depict Franco. Um, is it like when did this discussion really come to life and, was, and how um, did it evolve? Uh, okay, so uh, in order to do the transition towards democracy was this amnesty law, so that's why in a way, there was this idea that in order to have a democrat democracy, we have to pretend that everything is kind of okay, because otherwise uh, we will be divided, we cannot build a new country. But then you have to understand that that marked very much what happened later. 
So there were many people who was waiting for some kind of uh, recognition of the crimes or like to find their relatives and that didn't happen. So many of the um, monuments for uh, pro-fascism, -fasc pro-Franco, and they were still present all over the territory. So in 2008, with the government of um, uh, leftist government of Zapatero, they approved the historical memory law that was supposed to r remove those uh, images from public sphere. Um, in a way to avoid that people will still be celebrating fascism, and uh, also to allocate funding to uh, you know do, uh, do the exhumations and reparations to the victims. But soon after, the Conservative Party took over, and then they didn't derogate the law, but they didn't allocate funding. So for the next years, it was a law without uh, necessarily funding to be uh, implemented. So it was. Uh, due to certain municipalities, the one that implemented that we take uh, the, the, this uh, statue down, or we take it, but they were not destroying it. it was, they are all more or less in warehouses. And now, uh, back in uh, 2018, there was again, uh, uh, since then there is a, a socialist par uh, uh, association of uh, parties in the, in the government, and now, uh, recently, they have allocated again uh, you know, funding to carry out the mandate of the historical memory law. But until now, it wasn't happening. And my experience as an architect is that the architecture community, because uh, I might say that in Spain, some of the foundations of architectural uh, schools are very much entangled with uh, fascism. Um, it was very difficult to have these conversations, even the architectural faculties. And even people, uh, younger generations, they are not able to discuss these questions. In my case, part of the family members were uh, supporting the regime, but many others were fighting the, the, the forces, and many others have to go on exile. And when I discovered all these questions that were not discussed in my family, I dis I, that's what I started to go to talk with many people and so on. So it has been something I've been doing in my uh, holidays, in a way. So I'm not an expert. There are many experts doing that. But I was advised many, many times, don't go into this direction. Don't position yourself. Don't talk in public about these questions, because you are you're somehow um, signing yourself and positioning politically in a realm that is still very contested. Yeah. It's a really delicate discussion, and uh, um, you, well, if you do it in your holidays, it must be kind of hard, right, to <laughs> be involved in this discussion all the time. Uh, well, yeah, I take my family to go to exhumations. It's not the most pleasant holidays, but in a way, <laughs> I've met uh, amazing people who are doing work with so little uh, support until now. And for me, it has been very interesting to learn these stories of my own country and my own history. Yeah. Um, how do you see your role in this discussion, and maybe to take it broader, in discussions on contested heritage in the Netherlands? What could you do, and also as a director of an association? Um, well, in regarding to contested heritage, um, I think we try to neutralize the discussion uh, because there are a lot of, uh, well, what you said, uh, it, heritage can always be made political um, by, by political politicians, by parties. Uh, for eight years ago, we had one uh, uh, right-wing party uh, in front of a windmill and uh, heritage was, well, set up as the real Dutch way of living, which you should keep. And so we, we try to uh, stay far from this kind of political issues. However, um, it is also interesting to, to be, um, well, as, as an organization, the, the party to just um, try to, to tell the story. Uh, and, and why are certain monuments erected? Why are certain buildings as they are? Um, uh, set it in their time and evaluate it from that perspective um, and then think about the use of it and is that use which you uh, will, will try to uh, give it the new use, is that um, compared to the original building or monument, is that a good solution? That's, that's the question. 
re very recent, we had one of the bunkers in, uh, in Wassenaar uh, and it was even a, a political discussion that it should not be sold to a p private investor because of uh, the, the, the possibility that there should be some commercial uh, use which is not uh, uh, in, 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 in the real, um, um, that, that is not proper to the, the original destination and, and it's a memorial site. So yeah, we, we try to stay active and, and very keen and very clever on that, that kind of topics. Is it, I mean, um, I'm also a historian um, and the one thing you don't want is that nobody cares about history but maybe you also don't want everyone yeah. protesting everything and, uh, yeah. and, and that uh, heritage is contested. So how do you involve uh, people in, um, in, in heritage? Um, is it to interest them, it, oh, maybe not only if it's contested, I mean, then you get oh, a lot of intention. That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, we, are, we, are, we have 5,000 members, but we are a small organization, so a lot of work is volunteering. And um, we try to get people interested and, and to tell stories. And, uh, and the, the interesting thing in, is in, in Western Europe, we have a lot of uh, volunteers who are, are, are keen on uh, studying their own history, their local environment, uh, telling the stories. And it's different from Eastern Europe where there's a different uh, way of uh, uh, dealing with volunteers uh, or volunteerism. So uh, we try to, uh, to get people enthusiastic and to, well, sometimes we're campaigning. Um, re very recent a factory uh, built by Maaskant is torn, torn down in, uh, in North Brabant and it's a very uh, well symbolic uh, 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 and very nice design which was well, uh, neglected by the local authorities and that's, that's for us it's, it's really a fight and, and we go for it so no matter what it is um, we, we try to explain why heritage is uh, important don't demolish everything. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> Think um, before you demolish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, let's also dive a little bit deeper into into the options we have. We've seen some options of preserving, contextualizing, counter monuments, and so on. And let's let's discuss this, being architects and, and historians and architecture his, historians. Um, could you come up with examples of? Uh, I already asked you, but of examples how we could deal properly with. Um, uh, contested heritage, uh, difficult memories in a way that you say, well, I think this is a really nice example of what we did there to maybe add new layers of meaning to monuments. Could you give some examples? Yes. Can I start? <laughs> because I have a really good example. But before that, to answer to your question, I think that in, in terms of what we should do, it really depends from case study to case study. Sure, yeah. So, so it really, we should evaluate each case study separately and, and simply discuss. I, I would really like to put forward this idea of co creation. Yeah, there's no blueprint of how to deal yes, with it. Yes, precisely. Yeah. So, I really want, want to put forward this idea of co creation as, as uh, a way of negotiating, not only be between experts, but between people who are. Uh, not skilled in, in this in, in this kind of things, but have their own opinion because uh, only by discussing this burden heritage you can actually create this platform uh, for the future. And our only uh, concern should be, in my belief, is what kind of future are you going to create? What kind of future are you going to propose to future generations? And ask yourself whether keeping this heritage or demolishing it will provide this future. That's, that's the only real question there is, I believe. So we should start whenever we have contested heritage, not to look back, but just look forward. Look forward. Pre what precisely. is the future? How do we get there? Precisely, because the, uh, I would say that the, the mo whole point of heritage is that it carries some values on which you build future. So. I'm digressing here way, way too, too much, but uh, I heard a beautiful example recently on a lecture when they said um, when the United States declared independence, they removed all monuments of mad King George because they wanted a, f a future that is not connected with England. So look forward and think about the future, what kind of future you want to create and, and do everything you can to provide that future. That, that will be 
I mean, why looking back if if if, if it's if it's a burden? I yeah. mean, in in Yugoslavia, it's a burden, and this is why we cannot progress because. C could we maybe also because the historian here thinks ah don't demolish everything because then we can't write history anymore. Uh, should we put them in a museum or bury them or uh, like re demolishing everything in order to go to the future is also hurts me a little bit. I must say. That that, that brings me to an example because you asked for an example and I sure. have I have two really beautiful ones that are in the Netherlands because we are in the Netherlands and uh, these two examples are done by Dutch architects called Eric and Ronald Ritveld, uh, rough architects based in, in Amsterdam. And they did two amazing projects that I really, really love. The first one is Bunker 599 that I hope you, you, you know. So what they did is they took this bunker from the Second World War and cut through it as a way to, to show that, uh, well, it has multiple meanings. I will not go into it. But they wanted to show that it is a heritage that you can contest. Uh, challenge, create something new, creating something exciting, but also teach people about history and all kinds of things. And the second project they did is Delta Werk, uh, north in the country, uh, which was not a heritage site, but by making this intervention, they made, they made a heritage site. So what they did, they, I really like the approach because they recognize the history, so it's not like denying what happened there. It's recognizing the history and treating it with respect, but at the same time adding new layers of meaning through which we can learn about that history. And I think that is the way, way to go. Yeah. Recognizing history and looking forward. Marina? Um, yeah, okay, so I was thinking about resignifying monuments, but if I follow Ked Glass uh, notes, he says that the monuments still deliver ideology, even if they are contextualized. So it's not the same the case of Auschwitz, because it's not a monument in itself. It's a place that you can, you know, acknowledge the horrors that happened there, and, but it was not designed itself as a monument. Um, according to Ketglas, and I think in theory is the same, for instance, El Valle de los Caídos, the Valley of the Fallen, how do you recontextualize a place that has a cross that you can see from kilometers away? Uh, do you cut the cross in two? <laughs> that also is a particular ideology. So there are, <laughs> there are cases in which uh, contextualizing is not possible because the monument, the monuments, fastest monuments, and we know that from, you know, the monuments constructed by the Nazis, but also uh, the attempts that the Spaniards did with Franco, are designed to perpetuate, to, to last forever, to deliver the ideology. So it's our choice, but I think in my case, some of them will have to go. And um, if we build new monuments, they have to be built in another language, so to say, not in the, uh, the language of, of Christianity or fascism or those symbols you shouldn't use in your new monuments? That, that would be my take. I mean, it's a personal one, but I, perhaps I'm not interested in a more, uh, I mean, for me, a form of symbolism uh, would be more like a very quality architecture rather than a, a, a monument, like a, as we generally identify with, like a plaque or a statue. I think I prefer to remember those people by reading a book or by, a, in a way, materializing their ideas in the public space. Great, so looking forward to the future, um, maybe f not even building monuments, but other ways to remember, yeah? Kosha, maybe an example you, you really like of how people um, dealt with contested heritage? Well, what there, um, there's an example of the National Cultural Heritage Agency, which I really um, appreciate, and that was um, an initiative uh, to kind of create a multi-vocal perspective on um, objects within the national collection, so that's um, it's, it's movable heritage in this sense, um, but that have traces of, of slavery um, in them, or, or somehow connected, whether it's in the description of, of the object, which has been uh, done in the past, um, or whether it's the actual objects which was were directly connected to slavery. But the... Uh, the study in itself, or the, the, the project in itself, um, uh, invited 
per object, uh, various people from different backgrounds, from different uh, types of, of um, also prof professional perspectives, to describe the object. And I really appreciate this ty uh, type of, um, of working because for me, um, it actually really showed, I, I was surprised sometimes by the description people gave because for me it was so far off that it was like, pfft, um, how, how, where, how did you come up with that? Or how Could you give an example? Um, well, uh, for example, there was an, ex uh, there was an object was re which was related to maritime um, uh, heritage. So it was used um, on a boat. And in this case, there was a maritime ar um, um, uh, heritage professional giving a description. But there was also someone who was giving a description that was not connected to any pro professional um, uh, uh, or didn't, didn't have a pref professional knowledge of this type of particular ma maritime heritage, but still they gave a really nice description because by looking at an object, by um, looking at what it was used within the community that it was used, is giving a completely different description than a really quite static description that you would find in a catalog of an object. And I think that's the strength. Was it also like a more emotional description or more? It's much more vivid. I think once the communities connected to an object are included, and you cannot say it's just square. That's not enough because it, then all different types of um, uh, sensations really are coming uh, in the description. But it's also difficult because we tend to want to be objective in descriptions. Um, but. I think that comes directly to the point that you said there is no object without a, an emotional connection because that's when it becomes heritage. Yeah. Carol, an um, example you like? Yeah, the, fir the first, uh, I was thinking about a very good example in Germany, Vogelsang, which is a, a Nazi uh, school, uh, one of the, the few, uh, the four in the counterparts of the German Third Reich. Um, which was well recently uh, renovated, and uh, a part of it is built um, is, is now a, a museum, uh, which is very thorough and very profound with all the details, but also well the good and the bad stories and and the stories which are which you can can read and see there are really astonishing and and impressive, and the site is really impressive itself, and that brought me to. Um, the, the, the architecture uh, which is most contested are impressive buildings, impressive sites like you showed. Um, and in the Netherlands, uh, we have a sort of strange uh, way of neglecting important buildings and important sites. Um, so one of the examples which worries me most now is Paleis Hoesdijk, uh, the royal palace which is sold by the state uh, to a, well, a private company who is well renovating it and building new houses next to that site to uh, try to renovate the building and make it original. Uh, and that's a, that's a very complicated story and, and we, we did it. We let it happen 10 years ago uh, that it was sold to the market and that's the other way of heritage which is, well, in a way to be contested uh, the other way around. So. Well, and it's now the house of Sinterklaas. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, the Sinterklaas <laughs> gets to live in The 5th of December. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so a lot of, well, way of thinking about what do we do as Dutch people? Are we just uh, tearing down ourselves or do we have to tell the stories even better? Yeah. I was wondering about, since you came up with the money question, um, to what extent in the Ministry of Defense, the former Ministry of Defense, does money also play a role? Because I can imagine if it, costs a lot of money to renovate it or to you know, keep the construction. At one point, people will say, why are we spending all this money on this uh, broken uh, building? Well, based on some estimates, uh, actually reconstructing the building would not cost that much. It would be actually maybe even cheaper to reconstruct the existing ruin than to tear it down and build something new. Uh, but. Or, or maybe uh, people who say, oh, we can build beautiful uh, apartments over there. Yeah, well, there are all kinds of limitations. I mean, across, that across the street, you have government of Serbia building, so there is also a security issue. But uh, the problem is that, that in, in eyes of, of Serbian government, at least, selling the property is the easiest way to get rid of it. And they did this 
with many other contested buildings in Belgrade. The reason they could not do that with this particular building is because it got protected by the Institute for Protection of Monuments. This is the only reason why the building was not privatized uh, as others were. So, uh, but of course we should so be... They're swearing, damn it, we're on the list? Or Sorry? are they swearing, damn it, we're on the list, now we can't yes, sell it? Yes, yes, they are saying that actually. They are saying that, and this, all these attempts to demolish it piece by piece is actually to diminish its value so that it's taken off the list. Yeah. So it, it's all done purposefully, really, really calculated. Um, it's fascinating, actually. <laughs> yeah, but we should we should not disregard these economical issues and 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 that money is involved and private interest in is, is involved. I mean, we we cannot idealize heritage without acknowledging that there are mechanisms that are real life mechanisms that involve not only politics but economics that are guiding these processes. Yeah. Last question to round up. What do you think? I'll ask every, everyone. What do you think will happen to your monument, to the case study you mentioned in the near future? A little prospect. What I would like to see is consensus on its future. It can be whatever future there is, but I would like to see consensus of people, of people saying this is absolutely something that is good for, that, for our community and it will, it will help us move forward. And what do you think will happen? I would like to see it, uh, I would like to see some kind of architectural addition to it that would add another layers of meaning to it and maybe repurpose the building and, and bring some life to it. But realistically, I have to say that I'm not optimistic. I, th I, I see it demolished sooner or later. Thank you. Marina? Take one example. Yes, the, or, it's a question of like million dollar question in Spain. Um, let's say I want to be a imaginative, but I think they will ex uh, like do the exhumations to take the bodies and identify the bodies. That's something the families are asking the government to do. And when they are almost like th th they are able to recover most of the victims, probably they let the monuments uh, the decay. It's already very in bad condition, has a lot of leakages because Franco regime decided to do it in the core of a mountain, something very, very spectacular, but also uh, the construction is not very well done. So I imagine that will decay and it will be eaten by the um, uh, vegetation and we're inhabited by animals of the Sierra de Madrid. And f maybe the cross will fall um, by its own weight. Will also be spectacular, by the way. <laughs> um, you, what do you think will happen to Auschwitz Birkenau? Will it stay this way, or will something happen to it? Um, well, let's say when it's on the World Heritage List, we at least all have our the common responsibility um, uh, and objective to to keep it. I I I think I can only um, say on on a personal note is that I have two children and um, you know, even though the Second World War has, um, is far away, I still have a grandmother of 95 years old. And there's a connection of almost 100 years between my, my grandmother, who's still alive, and, and my own children. And I really think that places that have a connection to a past which is awful, but at the same time will help them to understand who I am, what I've been learned, but also what my um, uh, my grandparents have to go, have gone through, and also that that peace should only be the only thing that you would ever want to strive for. I think that's a, a message that I would hope they learn from these kind of places. And maybe also in the f further future, it, the evidence function stays really important. Uh, it becomes uh, more important. Uh, of course, yes. Yeah. Carol, what will happen to the wall of mustard? The next well, year. Um, it's a difficult question because it's still private property um, and personally uh, I think it's very good that it's a state listed monument now so um, uh, we have to be keen on that it's not um, in a more ruined state than it is now. Um, personally I think it's very good that, that, that not every, every object is, uh, is renovated and um, made a museum or something because we are very Dutch in tearing down or um, giving it a new destination. So for me it's good as it is by now, it's sort of a secret place a little bit. Uh, but in the, in the future 
it might be, and that would be a good destination, uh, one of the uh, focus points on the Second World War history. Uh, and we have a lot of remembrance places which are not that big, but very important, uh, uh, like Hotel de Wereld. Uh, next to it was the, the Peace Edict sign for the Netherlands. Uh, and in that sort of uh, um, way, it can be very, very uh, good in telling the story of the other way around, or the other way of and the, the, the black uh, side of, of the World War II. Maybe diversify the monuments as well. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your case studies and the discussion on this interesting topic. And uh, we can discuss about it for hours more. But um, thank you for now. Give them a warm hand, please. <laughs> um, and thank you for watching. And I'll give the floor back to Javier. Um, thank you very much for uh, your participation, your contribution, especially thank you very much for your generosity. So uh, thanks for being here. Uh, it's not easy to move around uh, the country at all, and I thank you very much for your contribution. Um, uh, next week, uh, we're going to give the word to the students. So the Stilos Association of the Faculty of Architecture will take over the BK Talks, and we will let them uh, speak about some of their concerns. Uh, we'll be back next year with the, uh, another BK Talks on, uh, on urbanization in the African continent. Um, and then uh, on the 21st of, Ju of January, we will be back with housing, a topic which is, uh, let's say, always there. It's a classic. Let's talk about density because we need to, uh, to address it again and again and again. Thank you very much and see you very soon next year. Bye-bye. <laughs>